Hello there, I'm James Duffy, one of your fellow NAR members, and I'm thrilled to be here with you for our first ever virtual NARCON. While I certainly wish that we could all be together at some sort of nerdy, cool rocket nirvana like recent years, I thought the virtual format of this year's NARCON would offer a unique opportunity to bring everyone into my workshop where we can do some cool stuff right here on my benchtop. For years, I had a postcard hanging on the wall in my office at work, and it was a favorite quote of the boss. It may have originated with Pablo Picasso, but the source really doesn't matter. The main idea is that great work is not necessarily the result of any divine spark or revelation, but rather building on the good ideas of others and repackaging those ideas in different ways, ultimately creating something new, hopefully great, and uh, exciting. There's no reason that we can't apply this idea to our little part of the world. Now, I tend to focus on scale model rockets, but the events of the last year have disrupted my vibe, and I've gone down sort of a, a sport model rat hole. In each of those projects, I've taken the skills I developed for my scale models and repurposed them, essentially stealing. Here's an example along with a question. What exactly is the difference between a simple sport model like an Estes Alpha and a basic scale model like the Estes Black Brant 3? They both have a tube, a nose cone, and three fins. Perhaps the biggest difference is just the paint job and markings. So why not put a fancy paint job on an Alpha? Well, there's no reason we can't do that. Here are a pair of Alpha models that I built a few years ago using a set of decals intended for a P-51 model. I just had it laying around the workshop. If you don't build static scale models, you may not be aware of the fact that there exists a huge variety of aftermarket decal options for plastic models. And there's no reason that we can't use these decals on our model rockets. This Alpha has a simple camouflage scheme with a gray underside and an olive drab upper surface along with a red nose cone. No masking was used to separate the gray from the green. The gray underside was painted first and then the olive green was sprayed over the imaginary topside. The red nose cone was painted separately and then the decals were applied from the P-51 sheet. All of the paints I used were Tamiya spray lacquers left over from earlier quote-unquote serious projects, so there was no real investment in additional supplies on either of these. I seem to recall that they were scratch-built from spare parts I had laying around, not official alpha kits, so the only real investment here was my time. Importantly, these were both fun projects, not something built with a specific goal in mind. I simply wanted something that would be great to fly at local club launches. The Silver P-51 Alpha was a little trickier as it required a bit more planning. After assembly and priming, the fin area was hit with gloss white, as was this midsection. The area for the D-Day invasion stripes were then masked off with Tamiya tape. You'll hear me talk a lot today about Tamiya products, as they always work well. And then the model was sprayed with gloss aluminum lacquer overall. Finally, the black areas on the invasion stripes were masked and sprayed, and the nose cone was painted separately. Finally, the decals were applied. So there's kind of the thesis statement for what we're going to do today. We're going to take a model that was designed as a sport rocket, steal some techniques from the scale modeling world, learn some new techniques along the way, and end up with something way cool, very fun, and very different at the end. One thing we can keep in mind is that this same approach, everything we're going to discuss today, will work on larger, mid, and high power models just as well. The markings might need to be replicated with paint instead of tiny kit decals, but we can do that by reaching out to a cut vinyl vendor like Mark Hayes at Sticker Shock, or you can try doing it on your own with a Cricut personal vinyl cutter. Here's a mid-power example. I've built a bunch of bumper whack models over the years, so when Estes released their 4-inch Red Max kit a few years ago, 
I bashed together a two-stage version using that kit plus a regular size Red Max, creating a two-stage rocket I called your Bumper Max. Most of the markings were masked and painted, but I had Mark at Sticker Shot cut the mission number decals to add that final touch. With the new three inch diameter Red Max due soon from Estes, I've got an itch to do something very similar with an allied D-Day theme, perhaps like the Alpha project we saw a moment ago. Maybe I'll call it a GI Max. For our first project, let's take a look at the Estes Explorer Aquarius. This kit was first released 30-ish years or so ago and has recently reappeared. It's a cool idea, an outer space vehicle sporting a crop of fuel tanks, not unlike early interplanetary concept art. When I look at these tanks though, I see something altogether different. Rather than fuel tanks, I see a train with a wide assortment of colorful boxcars. So we're going to build that. Basic construction of the space train will be pretty much by the book with one notable exception. We're going to cut each of the aftmost fuel tanks into two separate cargo container pieces, giving us 24 separate pieces all the same size, not unlike standardized rail cars. Here's the main structure of the rocket already assembled and primed. The attachment locations for the simulated train cars or cargo containers have already been marked with strips of masking tape. When the time comes for final assembly, we'll simply peel off the paint, exposing bits of bare tube underneath. I'll go off camera now and spray some paint. The main airframe has been painted with dark red-brown spray lacquer, mimicking the vibe of an old train caboose. In a concession to the fact that this is a representation of a proposed space vehicle, the fin can area has been masked off and sprayed with a very purposeful looking dark metallic color. You may catch a hint of the pre-shading that I did up here on the forward section. We'll talk about pre-shading more when we move on to our next project. The original kit decals feature some simulated solar panels that are designed to be applied to the fins. Rather than use these, we can use pieces of styrene sheet that have been pre-engraved with a 1 8 inch square pattern. We've already cut these new solar panels to size and painted them with metallic blue lacquer. There's still something missing though. These panels are simply too clean and too monolithic. There's a quick and easy fix to that though. We're going to apply a contrasting wash to the crevices on the panels, then wipe off the excess. Again, we're going to use a Tamiya product, a black panel line accent color. It's very easy to use. The accent is brushed on quickly. Get a little more here. And capillary action will draw the color into adjoining areas. Before it dries, the excess is wiped away from the raised areas. We'll finish the rest of the panel now. There, this panel is complete. I've got five more panels to do and we'll be ready to attach them to the fins. Here are our six completed solar power panels. Next, we'll attach them to the fins with double-sided tape. Double-sided tape will be discussed in depth during our next project in a few moments. The display nozzle included with the kit was painted first with black lacquer, then oversprayed lightly with gunmetal. Next, we're going to airbrush a touch of copper to the open end of the nozzle to create the illusion that this is a frequently used component. It's time to start our train car slash cargo containers. Each container will get a unique paint job. 
I've already assembled and primed the 24 individual units. These are just a few of them. Just for fun, I've put together a list of brands that we can use as we paint and decal these, each based on a fictional or defunct company. Essentially, each container will be a separate, distinct modeling project. A sheet of decals has been whipped up in Adobe Illustrator with logos for our cargo containers, and I have plenty of different paint colors ready to go, so we'll end up with a wide variety of looks. The process that I use for printing and coating decals is one that Jim Filler taught me years ago, and he learned it from the late John McCoy. An overview of that process can be found on the Narhams website. We've completed painting the 24 individual cargo containers using a unique color scheme for each of them. Essentially, I rated just about every spray lacquer can that I had on the shelf for the base colors. I then used my collection of acrylics to airbrush the contrasting detail colors that you see here. Our next task will be to apply the corporate logo decals to each of these. The decorations on our cargo containers are complete now. Like real train cars, we've added a bit of a bonus in the form of some random graffiti. There's some on this one. Here's uh, some more. The Zima car has some, Acme Corporation, uh, Enron, all have been hit with uh, graffiti. These markings are from a set of N-scale graffiti decals, another fun idea that I've swiped from the model railroading world. Our containers are still a bit on the glossy side, but we'll knock down that shine when we apply a matte finish after final assembly. The Explorer Aquarius kit comes with a really neat assembly jig that we can use to install the completed cargo containers. However, it's designed for the longer rear tanks that are included with the kit, and earlier in this project we cut those rear tanks into shorter units. There's an easy fix though. Just install the 12 forward cargo containers and then flip the model around. We can use the front half of the jig now to install the rear tanks. Our nose cone slash command module has been pre-shaded, primed, and painted with a couple of coats of matte white lacquer. After that cured, we applied two coats of pearl white as a final color. The pearl white looks great, but it tends to be translucent which is why we painted the matte white layers first. Next, we'll mask off the canopy area and apply some semi-gloss black with an airbrush. We can then finish off the command module with some decals. I hadn't planned on showing this next step on camera, but the masking job amused me so much that I changed my mind. The curved bits of masking tape in here were created by using a French curve to guide the blade against a wide bit of tape. And with the addition of some decals to the command module, our space train is completed. Now let's have some more fun. For some strange reason, an Estes Mars lander has never crossed my workbench, so I resolved to do something about that void in my life. My good friend Jim Filler hooked me up with a copy of the Semrock reissue of the kit. Now, we could just do a standard build, but that's not going to happen in this dojo. So let's steal some ideas from the history of the lunar module used for the Apollo program. The early concepts for the moon lander were very cool. They were much simpler and sleeker than the actual flight articles. By the time Apollo flew to the moon, though, the actual lunar module hardware was much more purposeful. It was more colorful. It was more utilitarian than the concepts. So what if we steal the idea that the Estes Mars lander was based on a similar early concept? What would the actual production Mars lander have looked like? Well, we're going to find out. One thing I'd like to try as part of this project is to use as little paint as possible. 
Instead, we're going to apply colored foil in a logical pattern, much like the lunar modules were covered with a variety of silver, copper, and gold films. Here's a variety pack of colored candy wrapper foil that I found on Amazon for about 10 bucks. We're going to build up the leg assemblies on the Estes kit, or the Simrock kit rather, and then cover them with a variety of foils, kind of like a real exoatmospheric space vehicle. The Apollo lunar module used a variety of thin metallic coverings in different shades to cover various parts of the craft. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. Applying the foil to the parts is easy to do as long as you use the right double-sided tape. The scrapbook grade stuff you'll find at your local office supply store is not the right stuff. Instead, you'll want to use 3M type 465 or 924 tape. This is normally sold in bulk through industrial suppliers like Granger or Uline, but I've been able to source single rolls via Amazon. We're going to use some scrap material. This is just a square of balsa here. And I'm going to demonstrate the technique we're going to use to you. We're going to take a piece of the double-sided tape, apply it to the, the substrate, the material, in this case the balsa, and then peel it up. Just wrap the sticky part around the rest of the balsa. There, we've got our double-sided tape in place. It's a little awkward to handle, but you'll get used to it after a while. Next, I'm going to take some foil. This is scrap foil left over from a dry run of the project. This is the silver color. You'll notice that I've crinkled it up to make it look more prototypical, not unlike the foils used on the lunar module. Note that there's a shiny side and a dull side. If you're using the silver, you need to be aware of that. We want the dull side on the outside. I'm just going to take that, position it over the balsa, rub it gently down, and then wrap it around the edges. I can take a knife, trim off the excess, on the actual product, we'll get a little more elegant than this. And then wrap it into place. There, we've got a part, a dry run part, ready to go. So let's set that scrap to the side. Here's a completed leg assembly from our Semrock kit, already covered with foil. We're going to start with the assembled landing gear mount, leg panel, foot pad, and strut brace assemblies. We're going to apply the foil and then bring all the parts together. All of this is done just like the instructions dictate. We're just interrupting the process occasionally to apply the foil. You'll also note that I've pre-painted couple of the parts black that will have areas that are not covered by the foil. I've also pre-wrinkled all the material to give it that exoatmospheric prototype look. Let's start with a foot pad with the video sped up to hurry things along. We'll cut out two circles of foil a little bit bigger than the foot pad. We'll apply some double-sided tape, add the foil, and smooth everything into place. The opening on the foot pad will then be sliced open and we can smooth out the ragged foil around the edges.
And there's our completed foot pad. Let's move on to the leg. Note that I've marked the location where the strut brace will be applied to the leg. Eventually that's going to be a glue joint, so we won't want any foil or double-sided tape in that location. We're going to apply the double-sided tape to the rest of the leg, apply the foil, and then come back and attach the glue-covered brace parts. And with that, our leg strut is covered. One side of each leg brace gets a covering of gold foil, and then we trim away the excess. I painted these black first, as portions of the part won't be covered, and will ultimately be visible, especially along the edges. And there are the completed leg braces. The landing gear housing is a bit trickier. After the tape is applied, the foil is added, much like wrapping a package. The opening for the landing gear is then cut away and smoothed out. You can see why we pre-painted this part in black, because the interior surface peeks out a little bit. If the raw balsa were visible, it would mess up the look of the part. Let's get started. We've got a small hickey in the covering right here. This is a great opportunity to show you how we're going to fix that. I take a small piece of the double-sided tape, slap some scrap foil down onto it, and then literally cut out a patch the size and shape that I need. And there, we fixed it. The simulated shock absorber assemblies are then cut to size, after which we can cover them with strips of tape and foil. These can be added to the leg and strut assemblies using small drops of medium CA glue. Now that we're done with the leg assemblies, the time has come to add foil to the main airframe section, what the kit calls the descent stage. Here's a section that's already completed, so we're going to add the foil to the next quadrant. Note these little pencil lines I've drawn lightly in to guide me. After the large section of foil is in place, there will be a small bare section right above here, above the hinge that we will need to cover with a small foil patch.
and there's our completed section. We'll complete the other two sections off camera. You'll note that the look of the workbench has changed a bit as we're about to start spraying some paint with an airbrush. If you recall the photo of the lunar module from earlier, there were some random black patches on the vehicle. These were used primarily for thermal management on the lunar module. Basically, these were places on the vehicle where the designers wanted heat to be absorbed rather than reflected, which was the job of the shiny foil. I've masked off a couple of sections that look vaguely LM-ish on either side here, and they look kind of purposeful. Uh, again, we're stealing ideas from the real hardware. The airbrush we're going to use is a simple, single-action Pache Model H, and I'll be spraying Tamiya flat black acrylic paint. All right, we've let the paint settle down a bit. Now let's pull off the masking and see how things look. And there's our second section. I'm really pleased with this. It looks like parts of an actual lunar module. The time has come to begin work on the upper section of the Mars lander. Much of this will be done exactly like the directions dictate, with a handful of changes that we'll cover. The big change is that we won't be using the internal launch lug, mostly because I don't like the exit gap at the leading edge of the forward shroud. Frankly, there's no way to get this shroud to curl elegantly. Instead, the kit part is going to be used as a template to cut a new shroud from 010 styrene sheet without cutting the notch for the lug. Here's the finished result already in place on the lower shroud from the kit. With all of this assembled, it struck me that the embossed detail on the aft shroud is unfortunately kind of soft and ill-defined. Fortunately, that's easy to improve with the addition of some simple detail parts made from styrene shapes. All of the new details that you see here are bits cut from styrene sheet, then jazzed up with parts punched out of scrap using a couple of scrapbooking punches that I borrowed from my wife. I also added a couple of longitudinal details made from half round styrene stock. Here are the scrapbooking punches that I used. This one simply cuts round discs in a variety of sizes. You can rotate the cutting head to the desired size. And this one cuts a unique rectangular shape, which can be used to simulate all sorts of things, such as access hatches, handholds, and antennas. Here are the little bits that this cutter ultimately yields. The overall effect of this really gives off a Gemini spacecraft vibe, which leads me to an important color decision. The larger shroud section, the lower section, is going to be white, and then the forward section will be a dark shade, much like the Gemini recovery section. This has already been painted with, to me, a white primer, so we can begin painting. On the white section, I'm going to use a technique called pre-shading where details will be highlighted with dark paint before the final color coat goes over the top. The theory is that the underlying dark bits will just barely peek out from behind the color coat, creating the illusion of depth and shadows. We'll give it a try.
And with that, we're done pre-shading the upper section of our Mars lander. Again, we didn't need to be particularly neat or clean about this. All we want to do is put shadows in place so that when we go back over this with a lighter coat, those shadows will barely peek out to again give the illusion of depth. Now you'll notice I put it up here on the top, which is gonna get covered with a darker color. Uh, that won't peek out nearly as much, if at all. Uh, it's just good practice and uh, good skills building for me to go ahead and do it on the whole piece. I've zoomed in just a little bit here. We've sprayed the shrouds with four light coats of Tamiya Pure White Spray Lacquer off camera and we can see the results of the pre-shading. Note that the panel lines and details are just a little bit darker than the other areas of the aft shroud. This will really help the final result to pop, especially after we add some decals and get everything pulled together. There are plenty of pre-shading tutorials out there on YouTube if you're interested in learning more. Let's turn our attention to the upper shroud. Continuing on our Gemini theme, this is going to be airbrushed with Tamiya Semi-Gloss Black Acrylic. Rather than tape, we're going to use a masking material called parafilm. Apparently this is used in wet labs to seal various sorts of containers, but it has some unique properties that make it great for masking. Be aware though that you can't use this with solvent-based paints like enamels or lacquers. Ask me how I know sometime. For use with the acrylics that we're using for this step though, it's great. To use parafilm, you simply pull away the storage sheet and then you stretch it. And then that can be applied to the surface you're masking. It's very flexible and conforms to the details on the model very, very well. I've pre-masked a couple of sections here along the conduit details that I know the parafilm will have some difficulty with. Okay, we have our masking material in place and we're ready to paint. Okay, the black paint is in place. Let's go ahead and remove our masking materials. Okay, the masking materials are off and this really does look like a Gemini spacecraft. I would love to have a beer with whoever designed this model and find out if that was intentional. During the test fit, it occurred to me that the foiled sides of the descent stage were just too stark and plain, even with the black areas that we painted. We can fix that pretty easily though. We're gonna steal ideas from the lunar modules that flew to the moon. The bottom half of those spacecraft were covered with all sorts of cool little storage containers for the tools used on the lunar surface, along with experimental gear and even antennas for radar, telemetry, and communication. By raiding the styrene scrap box again, we can create our own versions of those bits, painting them in a variety of shades that will break up the look of the large foiled surfaces on our model. Here I've got a couple uh, imaginary racks that might go on like this. Here's uh, maybe that's a, uh, a sample return container that could be mounted on one of them. Uh, what else have we got here? Here's another equipment box that can go somewhere. Note also that I've added a couple micro rail buttons here. Uh, here's a couple other bits that can be added, maybe some type of emergency equipment or uh, uh, some type of liquid fuel or something that can be added. Here are some radar antennas that we can add somewhere. My thinking was this one could be mounted somewhere in here which will rationalize that diagonal line we created. Uh, this might be a radiator for some type of uh, high heat system. We can add that there. The idea is that we can create whatever we want here. We're not bound by the rules of scale modeling here. We can use our own imagination. We can even steal ideas from the real world if we want. 
So that'll be really cool when we get it all put together. Time to add some decals to the parts of the model. These are the kit decals, which frankly are a bit underwhelming. I may use the US flag, United States lockups, and the vertical USA bits, but the rest will be added from my decal stash. Speaking of my decal stash, here it is. Over the last few decades, I've purchased a bunch of decals, usually from the clearance bins at model shows. I've found that having a variety of marking options are a great way to put the finishing touches on a model. I've gone through the binder though and pre-selected a number of options for our reimagined Mars lander. In particular, tiny little data stencils, ground marks, and warning markings are what we're in search of for our model. There are plenty of options on these sheets and we'll pick and choose from them until things look just right. Now, I admit that saying just raid your decal stash is a bit of an absurd thing to say. So here's an idea of a single sheet that would be great for this project. This is a set of data stencils for a 132nd scale USAF F4 fighter. And it has all sorts of cool stuff that we can use for a variety of projects. In addition, I may also be using these flag United States lockup markings that came from the Estes Little Joe kit when it was released several years ago. So let's put on some decals. After applying about 160 different individual decal elements, here's the current state of play. I've always felt that decal application is the point of any project where things really start to come alive, and this project is proving to be no exception. The nose of the Mars Lander has always bugged me, and that may be one of the reasons that I've never yet built one. There are a couple of reasons that it doesn't look right. First, the shape is just too lumpy. It lacks any sense of elegance. I've never seen a built Mars lander where the nose cone didn't look like a chunk of balsa that had been gnawed on by chipmunks. Next, there's a practical problem with the design. How is the crew of the Mars lander supposed to dock with another spacecraft or space station? We clearly need a docking adapter and hatch, so let's build one. The docking adapter will be built from parts found around the workshop, including a section of BT-60 airframe, a coupler, some centering rings, a bit of BT-50, and a paper bulkhead for the forward end of the assembly. Okay, we've allowed the two sections of our nose assembly to dry just a little bit, and now we're going to bring them together. That looks about right. Next, we'll add some detailing, we'll add some paint, some decals, and it should fit quite nicely on the forward end of our model. After a bit of paint and decal work, along with the addition of some styrene detail parts, the docking section is now complete. Just for grins, the kit nose cone was painted and decaled as well, so we have a choice between the new and the old interpretations. And there is our completed, reimagined Mars lander ready to fly. Finally, here's an unfinished project that's currently in work, an old Estes Maxi Brute Star Wars X-Wing fighter. This kit was purchased years ago in anticipation of doing a really detailed build of an X-Wing, trying to be as faithful as possible to the filming miniatures. The kit parts left me a little bit disappointed though, and I shelved the kit for more than a decade. Fortunately, Scott Branch told me about an online forum called the RPF, which is an online community of people who build replicas of film props, models, and more. Spending time on those forums, I learned that the Estes Maxi Brute kit is very highly regarded by the folks who know about these things and is considered one of the best starting points 
for building a really great static X-Wing model. So I pulled my model down from the shelf and started planning to build. I decided to start with the wings and that's as far as I've made it. The four wings you see here represent about 120 hours of work so far. Most of it invested in building masters and molds for the resin to parts you see here. Uh, these are the uh, master and the mold for the wing inserts that appear here on the inside surfaces of the wings. In addition to the wing inserts, we've got simulated turbine housings, access panels, fore and aft plates, and much, much more. This is very, very similar to how the filming miniatures were built decades ago. Now, while all of this is far beyond the scope of this presentation, I would like to highlight one little trick used on the wing parts, and that's the paint chipping that you see here. This is a simple technique that yields great results, and I'm going to demo it with some scrap material. This is a piece of styrene that I've sprayed with Tamiya primer and then painted with Insignia White Lacquer, which is in truth a very, very light gray and a good base coat for our X-Wing fighter. This area is masked much like the fin flash markings on the filming miniatures, and we've got some generic stripes over here. I'll paint this side a little lighter so we can compare the two areas. Here's the liquid mask material that we'll be using, a quick drying liquid mask sold by Vallejo. If you have a local hobby shop, you may be able to get it there. I think I ended up buying mine on Amazon. We're going to apply some of the liquid mask to the painted surface in a random pattern, then spray an acrylic top coat over that with an airbrush. I'll spray some parts again heavier than others, trying to get a more heavily weathered look over on this side. We'll use different sides and orientations of the rubber in order to vary the appearance as much as possible. After this dries for a few minutes, we can spray the color coat over the top. Okay, we have our color coats on over the mask material. I've gone a little heavier over here, a little lighter here. Give me a couple of moments to clean my airbrush and we'll come back and remove the masking material to see how everything turned out. Now here comes the cool part. The tape comes off and we can also rub off the rubber revealing the chipped paint effect. So Okay, all of our tape is off and the rubber is still in place for the most part. Watch what happens next. Okay, we've still got a little bit of cleanup to do, but you get a great idea of how this technique works. Again, it's very simple and it's a great tool to have in your bag of tricks. Come back to Narcon next year and perhaps I'll have the rest of this X-Wing project completed. That brings us to the end of our presentation. Here's the collection of projects that we worked on over the last hour, all of which featured techniques that we borrowed from the scale modeling world. Thanks for taking part.